Good afternoon, everybody. I'm going to get everybody settled here. We're going to get this right on the road. Uh, we're crunched or a little crunched for time, so we're just going to get rolling here. I want to welcome everybody to uh, Cisco's fifth and final sponsored session of the day. Uh, we had four great sessions earlier today. I'm glad you were able to turn out for our post-lunch session. Uh, this is the big deal. This is our premiere session with Lou Tucker. Uh, Stephen Dake, both from Cisco, Michael Schmidt from uh, SAP, and they're going to dive deep into the work that Cisco and SAP have been doing in the container space. So with that, Lou, great. all yours. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. And it's great to have you guys here. In fact, many of you could probably give this presentation because I think the work that we're seeing being done in OpenStack uh, with containers and Kubernetes is extremely exciting. But, and we started this work almost a year and a half, two years ago, uh, when we were sort of fundamentally um, trying to sort of answer the question, can there be a real advantage if we start looking at these technologies together? And so that's why I wanted to title this talk really about operational advantage when you start looking at these two major technologies and drawing the best from each one into the same integrated environment. Uh, those of you who actually deal with customers or your own deployments recognize it would be really nice if we can make this ultimately into a single unified environment. And so we have a choice for the developer, whether to be on a container, if they prefer that packaging mechanism, or if they need the isolation and multi-tenancy of a virtual machine. We want these things to, to come together. So in many ways, I think the people have pitched this sort of as a battle between these two technologies. I've heard people saying, well, containers are going to be taking over OpenStack or that OpenStack, and then we'll just be having containers on top. Um, so what is the right model for this? These are two different technologies. And it's analogous, you know, we've got in most major applications, you're using more than a single language. Um, I'm also vice chairman of, of the OpenStack Foundation. One of the questions we always are trying to address is Python. Does everything have to be in Python, or do we find a way to start embracing larger numbers of technologies? And when we, we have made decisions that we really do want to embrace uh, containers in this. So I don't think this is a battle at all. I think it's something that is going to be able to draw upon the advantages of both. Um, so to talk about it, uh, just to level set everybody, for those of you who are not as familiar with, with this area, that containers, in my view, are just an excellent way to, to package up an application and all of its dependencies. So you can run that application on any server Independent of what the particular packages or, or Python or what might be on the server, you can bring those things with you. And so it is a container, just like a shipping container, that you bring everything you need and you can run that on server. But at the same time, you're leveraging everything that's underneath you. So this means you've got very, very low overhead. You can spin up hundreds to thousands of containers on a single server. You can bring them up very, very quickly. And that you also, it fits much more with this model of microservices and disposable services. And if you want to upgrade, you just, you just bring down one container quickly, replace it with another. You can do that en masse. And whenever you've seen demonstrations of containers, I think that you're always impressed. They say, okay, let me bring up here 400 containers and go zip, 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 and they're all being brought up. That speed of it also means that we can do things such as upgrade much more readily. Um, and at the same time, then, we're seeing that the containers are coming out of a lot of the work we've seen in Docker and then container orchestration, uh, things like uh, Mesosphere, and we're seeing that in Kubernetes. So the entire tool chain around containers, I think, is being vested in very broadly. And so the fundamental question is that then why don't we in the OpenStack world start trying to take advantage of this technology? Uh, it seems like this is something that could be really used if you think of now the set of services that make up OpenStack, Nova, Neutron, Cinder, and everything else, those are services. They can be made into containers, and we can get all the benefits of that. So the two big projects that, that are in this area, just again to, to level set everybody, are Magnum and Cola. Magnum allows you to run containers on top of a cluster of virtual machines. So it makes it very easy to go essentially from running containers on Amazon or Google to running it on OpenStack. You can bring those containers and you can use Magnum to create those environments, uh, such as Docker Swarm and Kubernetes. Cola looks at it the other way. 
Cola is actually now saying that containers are at the base level, and we're taking the OpenStack services and we're turning them into containers so that they can be running on top of some, an orchestration system, either directly using something like Ansible or using a real orchestration system、uh, such as Kubernetes. And so that's why those are the two different models. And so maybe we're, you know, and then on top of that again, you could run containers because if you want the isolation, you could still run containers on, on top of VMs. So you get the best of both worlds here, and so I wanted to, you know, start to really have this kind of statement about it, thinking that then the OpenStack platform becomes an application. It's built and deployed as a set of containers. So if in our software-defined data center we're saying that we have bare metal, we're increasingly looking at tools for how do you abstract bare metal and orchestrate the bringing up of bare metal, turning them into clusters. That's a whole other set of work around sort of metal as a service. On top of that, we see a container being the next layer of, of infrastructure. And now, on top of that, you could run OpenStack. In fact, you could run multiple instances of OpenStack. And so that allows you then to sort of mix and match, and you're giving the developers the best of both worlds. So we, in fact, we're we are motivated to do this at Cisco in the Cisco use case when we are looking at NFVI. NFVI is an OpenStack. Platform optimized for the running of virtualized network functions, and we would be distributing this as software to run as a solution in a customer's data center. One of the prime things we wanted to achieve was we wanted the deployment of that to be the same at everybody's data center. We wanted to encapsulate both the configuration and the services in these containers so we could put them everywhere and have them be the same. And we could also then rapidly update them and upgrade them simply by bringing in new containers, and we could have a distribution model out of a Docker registry. So we can now distribute this this software, OpenStack software, out of a Docker registry, deploy it everywhere the same way, and then upgrade very very readily. On top of that, NFVI supports in the applications such as network services, mobility, and media. Some of those are going to be in containers. Some of those are going to be in virtual machines. So we need this uniform environment. So it looks kind of complicated, this. But what this also wanted to show here, just quickly, is really that it's about the lifecycle management. And so with containers, we have a clearer model about how we manage the life cycles of each one of these containers, independently upgrading different components wherever we need them. So in the center of this is OpenStack, but as you can see around it, you have all of the other elements you need in a modern environment: a CI/CD deployment system, all of the automation for this, and then how do we do upgrades and updates? So these are, in fact, the number of services that have been containerized. So we've worked very closely. We're going to have Steve Dake up here talking about Cola, which was a project to containerize OpenStack services, and then these are all of the services that many of you may be familiar with, and it's not just the sort of the top-level services, but other services that you can see in here, such as Logstash, MariaDB, other things that we are putting out there as containers, so we can rapidly bring up this environment as as a set of containers、uh, supporting OpenStack. So. Without further ado, I wanted to bring up the real experts, the people really doing the work behind this. So first, I wanted to bring up Steve Dake, former PTL for Cola. Thank you, Will. Appreciate it.、Uh, so there's my Twitter handle. If you want to uh, Twitter uh, me, I'll go ahead and get started. So、uh, let's talk about、uh, highlights a bit for Cola Newton.、Um, As you can see,、uh, our graph is growing in terms of、uh, adoption, and、um, there's kind of three different colors here. The dark green is deployments; that's a one percent.、Uh, the、uh, kind of middle color green is、um, people that are evaluating Cola, and to, in, in this is a user survey from a year ago, and then six months ago, and then today.、Um, the user survey from six months ago. That was at three percent. It was at zero percent when we started a year ago. Now it's at three、uh, percent. This、uh, most recent user survey was at four、uh, percent. What's cool about this is if you notice here, the、uh, kind of the last、uh, green column is the interest level in Cola. That hasn't changed,、um, which means that our interest is actually increasing. Well, this is how I interpret the data. The interest is actually increasing. 
But those, those people that were interested before are actually now testing and evaluating COLA. So if you add these numbers up, you've got 1 plus 4 plus 11. That's about 16% of the operators that filled out the operator survey. So I think the data set was something like 262 people uh, or uh, deployments. Uh, that's pretty significant. Uh, now, again, 1% deployment, that's not a lot. But it shows that uh, people are really interested in this model. Um, Let's talk about the highlights a little bit. Uh, so uh, we can deploy, probably the biggest thing in my mind in this release is we can deploy from uh, bare metal uh, using Pixie. So from Pixie all the way to uh, a deployed OpenStack, we get from beginning to end. Uh, and that's a couple operations. You have to run a couple different commands. Um, one of them is uh, Cola Bootstrap, and the other one's uh, Cola, like, Ironic Deploy, and then Cola Deploy. So there's three operations, I think, that uh, actually result in the deployment of OpenStack from bare metal all the way up to a running OpenStack, which is pretty cool. Um, so we've had about 20 months of development on Cola. Uh, the first uh, five, six months, we floundered. So we worked on uh, Kubernetes. And so I submitted patches upstream to Kubernetes, and they're like, well, we're not really ready for those patches yet. Uh, we're trying to release 1.0. And I said, OK, um, we're just not going to use Kubernetes. We're going to do something else. So we, went, we tried Compose instead. And the idea behind Compose was we wanted to do an all-in-one deployment. Uh, now, once we got done with Compose and we got that kind of compute kit working with Compose, we decided that wasn't really going to work for us either. Uh, because a single node, and who wants a single node cluster except for developers um, that develop OpenStack. So we decided to go to Ansible. And uh, once we got to that point, uh, yeah, we were pretty, we were pretty set. Um, I mean, we, we pretty much were able to, within a year, get to the point where we have our adoption and our interest growth um, kind of going through the roof, in my opinion. I think it's a really strong... Um, one thing we did this cycle during Milestone, it was kind of towards the end of Milestone 3, and I want to send a shout out to the OSIC. Uh, they provided 130 nodes for us to test COLA. Uh, a fellow from, I, from uh, Intel uh, named Manjeet, I'm not sure, that's his IRC nickname, I'm not sure what his real name is. Um, he had given us 60, he had tested COLA on 64 nodes and found about three or four bugs, and uh, we fixed those bugs. And actually, when the first time we deployed COLA on the OSIC cluster with 120 nodes, 100 of those nodes were bare metal, were compute nodes, 20 were storage, and three were controller, it worked right out of the box. So once, but after we'd fixed the four bugs in uh, probably uh, three months prior, um, so that was really cool. Uh, you know, it's, it was very rewarding to see that, that OpenStack could work in a container environment. Uh, and for me, I felt like uh, OpenStack, that, that my mission on COLA, on that part of COLA was kind of completed. So um, COLA does full deploy, upgrade, reconfigure. So reconfigure is an idea of you've got this configuration that exists in the system. You want to reconfigure it without having to log into 120 nodes and, or 130 nodes or 500 nodes or whatever node count you have. And uh, it'll just reconfigure from one single source of configuration data and reconfigure your entire cloud. Um, so uh, we have really high degree of security. Uh, I'm kind of a security nut. So I think uh, if it's not secure, you might as well not ship it. So we have TLS support. Um, if you, if you missed my, my, uh, my talk on our OSIC scale testing, the TLS support, kind of the impact was 300% to 30% uh, depending on the load. So um, the 300% was like banging Keystone, give me a, a token. The 30% uh, was more like um, uh, just to go ahead and uh, create center volumes. So um, yeah, we have complete customization flexibility in COLA. So we can customize any value we want inside of OpenStack. So any, any configuration value you want, you can customize. The, the real advantage here is that you don't have to have this kind of development cycle where you say, OK, now I've got to add this custom key. Um, instead of doing adding the custom key, you just set it 
and you deploy it. And you, you're not reliant on the community to validate whether or not we really want that in our code base. It's all up to you. You can read the upstream documentation and it'll override, Colo will override those configuration settings. Um, now, I want to talk about a Colo Kubernetes project, which is a new project. We've been at it for about three months. It started six months ago, but it took like uh, two or three months to sort out what we wanted to do with it. Um, what I see this project doing is providing a converged data center. Data center. So a converged data center, in my mind, is you've got this kind of bottom layer, and Lou talked, spoke a bit about this, so you've got this bottom layer of Kubernetes, um, let's say 1,000 nodes, and then you've got OpenStack over here, which is like 500 nodes, and then you've got something else over here, which is all of your container system. This is the future of the converged data center, and this is really where Cola Kubernetes comes in. Um, now, <clears throat> let me move on to the next slide, because that's the end of the material there. <clears throat> I want to talk about the architecture briefly. Um, so we've got some Ansible code. This is just the Ansible, Cola Ansible code base. Uh, we've got some Ansible code. Uh, there's about 1,000 tasks, and 1,000 tasks uh, are divided into about 50 roles. If you know anything about Ansible, that's uh, kind of a boatload of work to do that. We've got about 50 services. A role is a service. That's another way to think of it. We've got Docker containers. We've got about 150 Docker containers. Uh, this kind of uh, spans the entire gambit of uh, things like uh, Elasticsearch. Um, we use something called Hekka, which is, feeds Elasticsearch with data. We've got MariaDB, of course, and then uh, uh, all of, a whole bunch of uh, big tent services. We also have some non-big tent services. We don't have a non-big tent policy, so we take services if people submit them. Uh, as long as they work. Uh, we, we're really big on focusing on container services first, so like we've got Magnum and Courier, of course, uh, integrated into our system. Um, that's pretty cool. And then finally, we've got our tools. Uh, you probably can't really see this all that well. Yeah, you can't really see that all that well, but there's, we have 12 CLI commands. The 12 CLI commands allow you to control your OpenStack system completely from beginning to end with just these 12 CLI commands. So instead of operating the cloud by having to staff up uh, 30 or 40 people to understand how OpenStack works, you work with these 12 CLI commands and maybe need three or four operational people you know, working kind of in shifts to, to operate an OpenStack cloud. So this slide here is our, is our uh, affiliation slide. Uh, so Cola is diversely affiliated. And the, the whole point of this is that if any of these, so this, by, this uh, pie chart, if you look at this, these are corporate contributors. The corporate contributors are, uh, we could cut off uh, four of these corporate contributors, COLA would still survive. So COLA isn't like dependent on one single vendor for success. If you look at kind of other deployment tools, they are. So uh, this is like a huge advantage in my opinion. Uh, the statistics on the right, um, the, the teal is the, uh, um, I'm not going to explain what each of the metrics are, but I'll talk about what the numbers mean. If, if the teal is under 50%, you're diverse, according to the technical committee. If the blue is under 80%, you're diverse, according to the technical committee. The green is how many contributors and reviewers we have, sorry, com committers and reviewers we have. Um, you, can, uh, you can look at this in more detail on Stackalytics, um, or you can look on the analytics website. Um, so finally, the last thing I want to talk about is our repository split. A lot of people in our community, uh, not our community, the OpenStack community, want the containers to be a separate thing. Now, we could just, you could just go take the repo and delete all the Ansible code bits and, and whatnot, and then you'd have your, Ansible, uh, your Docker containers. We think the Docker containers offer a whole lot of value. Uh, so we want uh, those Docker containers to be usable and reusable by everybody. Uh, they have an API. Uh, so what, what we're doing uh, between uh, Newton and Okada is we're splitting the repo of Cola itself into the Docker containers and the Ansible bits. And then we've already got a Cola Kubernetes repo, which is going to continue on. So uh, that's the end of my slides. Uh, I want to introduce Michael Schmidt now. And uh, he's got actually a, a great demo, which is fantastic about converged uh, converged data center. So, Michael?
All right. <coughs> Right. So hello everyone, my name is Michael Schmidt. I am working for SAP and I'm here to talk to you about SAP Converged Cloud. Um, before we start, a little bit of context. So SAP is the biggest German software company. We are selling business software for more than 40 years now. And if you're doing like any business transaction nowadays, there's probably some piece of SAP system involved in it. I spare you all the details. Um, with big companies, there come big challenges. And one of our problems is actually the fragmentation of our cloud landscape in-house. Last time we counted, we had 23 different properties. And of course, we are not crazy. That was not planned. It's all due to acquisitions, mergers, and just um, the innovation, innovation cycle spinning faster when we can move. We have the classical cloud and on-premise problem. So our software traditionally runs in the basement of the customers. But nowadays, they want to have it in the cloud. So we need to host their software or make our software being hostable in the cloud. Our flagship product is SAP HANA. It's an in-memory database. And it needs lots of memory, think terabytes. And that brings us to a bare metal use case we have. It does run in VMs, but the T-shirt sizes only go so far. And if you're really serious about it, you need to put it on real hardware. And of course, that needs to mix and match with VMs and containers as you do. We have uh, operations stretched across all those cloud proper properties. And we have a lot of processes and experience there, which we need to leverage also in the new world. And of course, it's 2016. If we're building up new things, it needs to be efficient. The solution to these challenges is something we call the SAP Converged Cloud, and it's actually a strategy. And to sum it up in one sentence, sentence we're going to rebase our company on OpenStack. And there's a few different initiatives working on the strategy, and one of us is my team. And our mission is to actually build up new data centers and put OpenStack on them. So we're talking about 18 locations, uh, 18 ECs in 13 locations. And uh, we have mixed payload we need to run. We have KVM, VMware, and bare metal. All needs to mix and match. The OpenStack footprint that we're looking for is the usual suspects, but also some not so usual components like Manila, Designate, Barbican, and also Monasca for monitoring. We also have a bunch of our own services, which we have developed in-house, most notably the five at the bottom. We have uh, an automation service we call ARC. Think uh, configuration management made easy for VMs, and you can run Chef and Ansible with a nice workflow around it. We have HANA as a service, which gives you HANA machines on bare metal, spinning it up using Ironic. We have billing as a service. We have our own dashboard we call Electra. It's a complete uh, re-implementation of Horizon, and we are actually using Ruby on Rails. So we're already breaking with the Python dogma. And of course, we need to have um, Kubernetes as a service. So how are we doing this? I think we have actually quite an interesting stack. We are also riding the Chiffy cloud, as you've seen in Austin from Alex Povey. So we have OpenStack on top of Kubernetes, and we are deploying Kubernetes in CoreOS. And we're putting these CoreOS nodes on Cisco UCS plates, so right on bare metal. And we have a bit of machinery to build this whole thing up from nothing. So our data centers are completely bare. They are just wrecked and stacked. And then we're going to put the software on top. So the left part of this picture is, a, is the control plane. And um, the second interesting property of our stack is that we have a separation between control and data plane. So we see OpenStack as a big remote control, which is orchestrating the hardware behind it. So in our case, we are using Nova to drive VMware, KVM, and also bare metal nodes, all hosted on Cisco UCS. We're using Neutron, uh, controlling Cisco's ACI to give us software-defined networking. Uh, Cinda and Manila are back with NetApp, and of course, load balancing as a service, we have F5. So all our payload is running in hardware, and the software side, the control plane is OpenStack, um, 
running completely separated of it. So what I want to do now is I want to jump in each of these layers and give you more details what it looks like. So we start with OpenStack. We are running it completely containerized, 100%, and it's all Kola containers. Uh, we have our own CI CD system to build those containers um, and a bit of tooling to put uh, our configuration into it more easily. We are not using any of the Ansible stuff. Um, we think that's uh, the job of Kubernetes. Uh, the best containers don't help you much if you can't deploy them to your Kubernetes. And until recently, there hasn't been really a best practice out of the Kubernetes community on how to do this properly. So naturally, everyone went off and built their own tooling, including us. We actually built it four times and threw it away again. And, uh, but recently, the Kubernetes com community is coming up with this blessed way of deploying applications, and it's called Helm. And in easy terms, it's just a package manager for Kubernetes applications. So we rebased our stuff on Helm. It took us two weeks. Um, and we think it's the way forward. So we've been running around and uh, talking about Helm this whole conference, trying to make this a reality. It's not perfect yet, and it needs a bit of work. But I think it's the right time to do this and uh, jump on the right horse so that we can take the best of both communities, actually. The biggest driver for us in choosing this is that it's not only deploying OpenStack, but also all other Kubernetes components. We're running additional software next to our OpenStacks to keeping it operated, like monitoring systems. There's Prometheus instances, exception tracking. We have this whole suite of applications which we need to also deploy. And we need to have a pattern for our teams to know how to deploy those things. And that's what Kubernetes Helm is giving us. We previously tried to stick it all into our OpenStack build-up scripts, but that was just a bit too ugly, to be honest. It's um, open source, and you can find it at uh, the link, which you can't see. Uh, <laughs> it's uh, on GitHub, and the organization is called SubCC. Maybe I can put this up later. So on the next layer, we have Kubernetes. And I'm going to spare you the marketing pitch. You can, there was better, better presentations about it. The main thing about it for us is that it gives us an abstraction on top of the bare metal plates and an abstraction of our data center. And for developing the application, it doesn't matter if it's a mini cube running on your laptop or if it's actually a real data center. The setup we are using, it's actually, um, we have a VM-like workflow to install it. So if you install it on GCP or on Amazon, you're using the API to spin it up. And we want to do the same with our bare metal plates. And we're using IPMI and IPXCE to achieve that effect. For each of our data centers, we have a declarative definition, what it looks like, with all the IP addresses in it and the MAC addresses and all the layout of the machines and stuff. And we use that to drive an automation layer um, to set up all the infrastructure that we need to build this up. And then it's uh, pipeline driven uh, using a CI CD system. And we can just click and install a plate um, with a click of a button. Interesting thing is always how you do the networking Kubernetes. It has some specific requirements, which are especially on bare metal not that easy to solve. And there's uh, various vendors are setting solutions. For our use case, we found that it's all way too heavyweight. And we just stick some BGP routes into BERT. And we're talking directly with uh, ACI to do the networking here. And recently, you can't see this on the slide, but we also um, going into a more intelligent way of doing this. We have a, a Kubernetes controller which actually listens to the API and drives the ACI from there. So it's much more knowledgeable about the state of our services. And if something becomes unhealthy, it's just going to pull the routes out. Going further down to the hardware, we are shipping pre-manufactured pods, as we call it. I guess our hardware architects also want to play with pods. But um, the point about it is that it's a uh, well-defined bill of materials. And we pre-manufacture those racks. We ship it off into our data centers. And then we just have remote hands putting in the cables. And then our team comes in and puts the software on top. It's also how we scale this out, not only for the control plane, but also for our hypervisors, which are running on these pods as well. Uh, I want to come again to the topic of the split of the control plane and the data plane. 
the main thing this gives us is that we have independent SLOs between control and data. So we don't care that much that uh, our OpenStack is HA and perfectly available all the time, because when it's down, it's just the API, and our customer payload keeps on running in dedicated hardware. It also lets us sleep at night, because if something is wrong with our hypervisors, it's another team being responsible for it. It also allows us to make much easier um, upgrades of OpenStack, because our SLAs are not that tight for it. And it also allows us to keep our setup much simpler, because we don't need all that HA stuff. We are not using any HA for our databases yet, and so far it's OK. We see what the next escalation brings. Um, I actually have a small demo now for you. It's five minutes, and I'm going to show you how this whole stuff is built up and what it looks like from the top, if I can switch to the video. If it lets me. Hello. Ah, here we go. So we're going to build up uh, the complete data center from nothing. Uh, it's a console here, and you probably can't read it, but that's not that important. We're going to see some UIs now. Um, we're building up now first um, the configuration for the tooling, and we're using uh, Concurse CI, which comes out of the uh, Cloud Foundry ecosystem. We ported it to Kubernetes. And um, so this is building up the, the tooling around it. We're using a, something we call the boot config server, which gives us templated IPXE uh, functionality. And then we just have another pipeline which installs the control plane using IPMI and IPXE. We're going to jump into one of those nodes, and you can see what's going on. So we're booting CoreOS using IPXE, and then we're using CoreOS to actually install CoreOS on the machine. On first boot, there's a mechanism in CoreOS. It's called Ignition. And it just runs on the very first boot. And we use that to put our software on top of it, which is all the Kubernetes stuff. So uh, in the end, it's um, a few certificates and a few binaries. Uh, it's actually not that complicated to install it. Then we have a running Kubernetes. And what you see here is the dashboard, uh, the UI of Kubernetes. The next step, then, is actually how do we get our OpenStack on. And so for the purpose of this demo, we're doing this from the command line. Uh, you can see here what our layout of nodes looks like. We have three masters and a few farm nodes, we call it. That's the system components. And now we're going to put the OpenStack on top. And it's actually just a script. We're now doing this with Helm, and it's dropping the specs into the Kubernetes cluster. It actually takes not much longer than here. Uh, like 30 seconds to dump it all up, and then it's going to thrash around a bit, and eventually it comes up. And what we see here is our custom horizon replacement, which we call Electra. It gives us like a convenient onboarding mechanism for our existing customers. We have extended ABAC controls in it and almost UIs for everything you have in Horizon, including our own services. So we're creating a project here. It's all backed by Keystone, of course, and we're spinning up a machine. And then I'm going to show you what this control plane split, split does for us. We're going to do the usual ping demo. And uh, then we're going to shut down Neutron, and you will see that the VM keeps on running. An interesting thing about this dashboard is that we have um, a web CLI built in, which you see here. This is backed by Kubernetes as well. So you get your own pod where you have root privileges, and it gives you a pre-authenticated client already installed. So you can just remote control your open stack in this context of, the, of that project right from your browser. So here we are now in our VM, and it's happily pinging. In the middle split, you're going to see the Neutron components. And in the lowest uh, screen, we're going to shut down Neutron now. We have a um, monitoring facility around it. It's backed with Prometheus. And we have custom middlewares in our open stack to uh, give us Prometheus um, metrics. And here we are now deleting Neutron. And the interesting part is happening on the top. You see that uh, VM is just happily pinging SAP.com. While in the middle, um, Neutron is going to go to error state now. And um, you can also see that it's down on our dashboard here. If we wait a little bit, it's coming back up again. And um, this is basically the demo of our control plane split.
our customer payload just keeps on running even though we could delete the whole OpenStack and it would still keep on running. And with that, I'm also going to skip the next slide because we talked about it. I would like to thank you. We are SAP deploying OpenStack on Kubernetes. Thanks. I think we've got a couple of minutes. Yeah, we, have, we do have some time for a, few, a couple of questions. So if there are any questions. Up. Oh, okay. Yes. Can you go over a little bit more about how you're controlling the ACI for the route injection for the bare metal services on Ironic? Well, I'm, I'm not the specialist. Test, test. So I'm not the specialist in it, but we are using Neutron, and we have uh, custom drivers we are developing in collaboration with Cisco. The pattern we are using is called hierarchical port binding. It's due to our requirements to have more than 4K networks per region. And so we just have a custom driver for Neutron, which is remote controlling the ACI. I have our, our experts actually here. If you want to talk to them, he's sitting right there. Raise your hand. And yet, oh, okay, okay, you're going to make it difficult on me, I can see. <laughs> Hello, um, Michael, you mentioned that um, you were running um, uh, CoreOS and you're booting it from IPC and then you install, using CoreOS to install IPC on the hard drive. Uh, why are you not running it straight from IPC? Why does it need to be installed in the hard drive? I guess that's to get rid of the dependency of actually having the IPCE infrastructure available all the time and it's just like, I don't know, maybe the more traditional way of doing things, just installing everything. But it's definitely possible, and we've thought about it to just not install anything on disk. But there's also a few things which are persistent, like uh, the etcd store. So it's uh, not completely ephemeral what's happening, but almost. We could do it with IPC. OK, um, I had one more question. Um which I forgot, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can find me later. So. I'll, I'll talk to you later. Any other, okay, you are really <laughs> challenging me today. Uh, while we're waiting for the mic, I've got a question <laughs> of you all. Uh, how many here are running OpenStack on containers? We're trying to actually understand um, how widespread this is. One, two. Well, that's our guys. Your guys. <laughs> Except for SAP and Cisco. <laughs> Hi. So um, you spoke quite a bit about the compute layers. I'm curious what kind of analysis you did on the storage layers and kind of the thought process and trade-offs that you looked at as you built the architecture. This is a question to me. So the storage is also outsourced. We're using NetApp to drive it. So initially we thought about actually running Ceph inside of the containers as well. And um, yeah, our prototypes didn't go so well, so we didn't decide for it. Uh, in terms of storage, maybe interesting as well, something I didn't show is that we're also running Swift and we are actually provisioning the Swift nodes with all the hard disks using Kubernetes as well. And we have some custom tooling like to prepare the hard disks and it's like, um, we are making OpenStack a bit aware of the Kubernetes infrastructure. So there's a daemon set which is watching for new Swift nodes. And when we spin up a new one, it's going to find all the hard disks and it's going to format them using the Kubernetes API more or less. Yeah, as far as color goes, we use Ceph uh, today. So um, I think uh, NetApp is hard for, for community developers to work with. So COLA is a community effort, and then what SAP is working on is a product, right? So, you know, we, the, like the repo split upstream versus a downstream, uh, Cisco is upstream versus a downstream. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Not everything in COLA or COLA Kubernetes will be used in Cisco products or SAP products or a combo thereof. I guess you also have to differentiate between what we're using for persistence in Kubernetes and what we're using for our payload. Mm. And so in Kubernetes, we are backing it with NFS stores, and we have quite some trouble with it. 
but we also think that there is no really good solution yet for the whole persistence topic on the control plane. Maybe time for one more? Oh, okay, he remembered his question. <laughs> <laughs> You're gonna have to meet me halfway this time. You ran out of speed, Gary. <laughs> yeah, I remember my question um, for the gentleman on the left. Um, I wanted to know what's the difference between uh, Stacanatus on the CoreOS project and Cola, um, where the overlaps and what are the differences? Yeah, so that's uh, it's a complex question, but I'll answer it in, in, as simply as I can. Uh, in, in terms of the containers, Stacanetes uses Cola containers. That's why we're splitting out the containers. Uh, you know, if you look at this summit, I think there's been like 10 different companies or 15 different companies that have said, we're doing open stack and containers. Uh, so we want Cola containers to be the standard for that. Uh, so that's, that's standardized. And uh, I think that will remain the case, except for, for folks that need to have some kind of application that doesn't fit into our repos. But we, take, we'll, we, we really will take any container that somebody wants to submit, so very open about that. Uh, as far as the Stackinetti's effort itself in terms of its orchestration engine, uh, it, it uses uh, something called Cola Mesos, which was a project before Cola Kubernetes uh, that was mostly developed by Mirantis. And uh, we found that that didn't really work uh, the Mesos implementation didn't work very well, um, but they've used it to, they've taken the Mesos part out and put in Kubernetes and then left the kind of the rest of the infrastructure that was developed. It was really quite a good work. Um, I wish Mirantis hadn't have given up on it because I think uh, we'd be a lot further ahead. Uh, and I think uh, product companies would be a lot further ahead as well. I think it's kind of interesting that we're looking at Cola as being, I think, this kind of foundational place to bring together these different components that may be, as we go forward and learn more about it and learn what actual deployments they're needing, get sort of reconfigured and everything else so that we can actually continue to try to add different options into, into that environment uh, and all learn as we do this. I think that nobody is a pure Cola implementation today, I think, or, Oracle, I think, is pretty close. But I think that uh, we're seeing a lot of different variations here. But I consider that still a part of COLA because we're trying to make it so that things like the registry and everything else can really be fundamental to this. And especially the containers, that's uh, critical uh, for, that, for that combo there. Yeah, I'd like to see us do the testing of those containers by a large number of people in different deployments. Yeah. That's, that's what would really be of high value here. Yeah, very, okay. very much. I think we're probably we're, getting the, the we're, boot we're, here. We're, yeah, we're getting, the, we're getting the, the hook signal here. So thanks again to thank Lou, you. to Mike, to Stephen. Thank you all for coming, and we hope to see you all again in Boston. <laughs>